Good evening. This is Adam Carroll from uh, Muslim Progressive Traditionalist Alliance, and this is the War on Immigrants Report, uh, an installment of the Global, Global Movement's Urban Struggles programming on WBAI. And I'm Darlan Thompson from Families of Freedom, and tonight's show is basically looking at the 10th anniversary of 9-11, and it's a public discourse as to the meaning of 9-11. And September is National Disaster Month, and uh, emails are going around, preparedness tips and so forth, and we've just been through a um, hurricane experience. Uh, across the river in Patterson, uh, they're um, in flood mode. Um, in fact, uh, volunteers are no doubt needed, and uh, I hope that people are, are thinking of, of people in the Catskills and in Vermont and elsewhere uh, who are in need this evening. Um, in terms of disaster, um, the Village Voice, this uh, this week has a 9-11 story uh, about um, the the industry, the 9-11 industry uh, that is is active, um, working to um, uh, both um, promote um, nonprofit services, but also in construction, making billions of dollars on 9-11. Um, so, you know, the the whole um, complex of 9-11 is something that we'll be touching on today. Yeah, and speaking of 9-11, um, the stories, like whose stories included. Today's show will be considering some new tools available to those to include the ordeal in community con conversation. First, we will speak with Sekou Sebi, one of the co-directors of Rock New York, um, and also we'll be talking to Iram, or Iram Sheik. I hope I pronounced her name Iram, right. Mm -hmm. um, she's an author who is going to provide us with a backdrop, she just came out with a new book, Detained Without Cause, Muslim Stories of Detention and Deportation in America After 9-11. And also, we also interview Conrad Adder, the director of Life for Liberty, a nonprofit media project begun in 2002 to produce documentaries on immigrant communities affected by the post-9-11 policies. And um, Conrad, of course, will be talking about his new film, uh, which is about Farouk Almuti, who uh, was uh, uh, here at WBAI in this very studio, a um, uh, radio host, and was detained and unfortunately died in, in 2004. So we'll be talking about that, telling the story um, as, as, as he knows uh, Farouk uh, very well. Okay, so just run a little music, our usual Bob Marley roadblock. And we'll come back with some new news items, and then we'll get into the interviews in just a bit. Oh, well, that was not Bob Marley. <laughs> Obviously not. He's never silent like that, so no. such is life. Um, you know, in terms of the story of 9-11, of I mean, there are many. I just came from a, um, an interfaith meeting at Park 51 and, um, you know, uh, trading personal stories as well as talking about how we can deepen relationships downtown among faith leaders, uh, especially given all the nonsense that comes up around uh, Park 51, the media attacks. Um, you know, at, also there are been many, many 9-11 uh, uh, roundtables and discussions, and there will be many more. P uh, Prepare New York is one initiative uh, that's being organized by the Interfaith Center of New York, um, and they are doing 500 coffee hour discussions over the next few months ab around the 9-11 anniversary, the 10th anniversary. And um, also, though, to make sure that immigrants and Muslims are part of the story, um, um, recently, Amar Deep Singh, who is uh, now a liais liaison to the White House for the um, Asian American community, um, helped uh, community members host um, a uh, discussion of um, uh, the backlash and all the ripple effects uh, against our communities in the days and months and years since 9-11. And it's uh, worthwhile checking out if you go to the website. Um, there's a link on my one of my blogs, uh, which is nycivicpartnership.wordpress.com. And I'll be repeating that later on. Uh, but it, um, again, many discussions going on. 
Yeah, um, as we're talking about media and the things that are going on, this one immigrants report, a recent announcement by the administration about this question being given to prosecutors in immigration cases has stirred a lot of confusion and also a lot of concerns for people who are actually dealing with underground cases. Um, definitely need some clarity in what's being said and what is being believed. And unfortunately, we didn't hear Bob Marley, but one of the things he usually says is better to know than to believe. A lot of people believe in that somewhere along the line that the administration has stopped deportation for everyone and has offered some kind of amnesty. Totally incorrect. A lot of lawyers are also warning, do not go down to 26 Federal Plaza, turn yourself in and think that you're going to get some kind of, you're not going to be put in deportation proceedings. People need to understand what the announcement meant. It's nothing new. It's just a review of cases. People who have criminal convictions, it does not apply to you. It applies to people who are already in deportation proceedings. And again, please know and not believe some of the stuff that's flying around. Um, as we approach the 10th anniversary of 9-11, the Center on Law and Security at NYU has produced a 10-year version of its annual terrorist trial report card. And uh, this is available at www.lawandsecurity.org. Um, ten years after al-Qaeda's attack on the U.S., um, the federal government's record on terrorism prosecutions, it's relatively easy to summarize a he heavy reliance on preventive law enforcement, an increasingly aggressive use of material support statutes, and a high conviction rate. Strikingly, during the first two years of Barack Obama's presidency, the annual number of prosecutions of jihadist-related terrorism doubled. The nature of the threat has assumed relatively clear contours as completed or intended terrorist acts aimed against domestic U.S. targets fall into stable and recognized patterns. They talk about the patterns, and it's interesting that, uh, in fact, the um, one of the reasons is that um, Somalia uh, is being counted as a homegrown terrorism issue where it's really about an insurgency and another um, uh, a freedom struggle, if you will, uh, in another country. And so some of that is, is problematical. Uh, but they also talk about, of course, the, the, as they say, the rise in indictments over the past two or three years is significantly affected by FBI informant operations. To, since 2009, nearly 50 percent of terrorism cases have involved informants. At least 15 percent can be considered sting operations, which many of us would call entrapment. <laughs> yeah, to protect the humble, they keep changing the name. But um, given the fact that, um, are we done with the news per se? Yeah, we can go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, and the fact that we seem to be kind of missing with the music, um, I think we'll go directly to our first guest, mm -hmm. um, who is Sekou Sebi. He's one of the co-directors of Rock New York, originally a French te teacher from the Ivory Coast. Um, in 1998, Sekou was hired as a cook at Windows on the Window, Windows on the World, I'm sorry, the restaurant on top of the World Trade Center. He lost his job, obviously, on September 11th in the World Trade Center attacks, and became a mem member of an organization called WAP New York. Founded um, after 9-11, WAP New York was created to provide support to restaurant workers dip displaced as a result of the tragedy. Um, in reality, that restaurant also employed a lot of people who were undocumented and therefore became unknown or unnumbered in the tragedy that did happen. They lost a lot of issues in terms of the, those who survived and not having the right documentations and papers and stuff like that, actually getting access to some of these services. So hopefully, Sebu, Seku, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, um, that was just an intro, and I know your story is definitely compelling. And again, the theme is looking back at 9-11, where we're at now, and probably where we're going to be 10 years from now with the memory still, hopefully not as fresh as it is, but there it is. So tell us your story. Yeah, uh I think it was a difficult moment in 2001. Uh, uh, one of my uh, friends that I consider as a big brother from the Ivory Coast too, Abdul Karim Traore, was uh, working at Windows on the Wall because of him I got a job. And uh, it is especially the wife who called me on 9-11 in the morning and say, you know, I'm calling my, my husband and uh, I can't get a hold of him. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to help him because I don't know what was going on. I turned the TV on. I saw the building was burning. So I dialed the number of the restaurant, nothing. Uh was ringing, nobody picked up until when the building collapsed and it went silent. 
So that was really the initial situation that uh, happened. Now, the following morning, as I didn't really bring it to the forefront of my mind, I got dressed and I was ready to go to work. Because for me, it was 9-11 happened, but, you know, I had to go to work. That's when I realized, you know, I, when the building collapsed, I lost my job. You know, I didn't have that realization. The worst part, the difficult part was uh, uh, the center that was created on 54th Street called Pier 94. And uh, it has all the services. But who can go there was really the question. You know, uh, I was fortunate enough to be documented. I was fortunate enough to be one of the people who could have gone there. But at the entrance of PA-94, since it was still terrorism situation, you know, hype, uh, it was an NYPD. When you get in, it was the Homeland Security formerly called INS was there. And uh, you have to pass all those in order to get to, you know, uh, the Red Cross or FEMA. So if you are in a situation where you lost your job, you lost all your belonging, you cannot get to FEMA, you cannot get to Red Cross unless you go through all these security checkpoints. And many of the folks who were working with me who uh, were not documented couldn't go there. And that's one of the reasons why Iraq was created to be a not working place where, you know, you know information about a place where folks can get help, you bring that information and we can share. And uh, those who were undocumented, uh, places they could have gone, we can tell them this is where you can go, but you couldn't go to, you know, uh, PA-94. But that's really my story. And uh, I remember one of my former co-director, Fikak Mamdu, had a lot of trouble. Uh, in PA-94. He was, uh, he was an Arab from uh, Morocco. And uh, the situation for Sean was he was trained by the Red Cross to uh, assist in a disaster relief. But because he was Arabic and uh, immediately identified as a Muslim, you know, he was uh, at some point denied access at PA-94. And we have to call a lot of security people, double check and triple check and quadruple check before they let mom do, do his work. And it has nothing to do with, you know, anything else, but this is a guy who was ready to help other people. He was a simple Muslim with a Muslim name. So just a quick question there, just to roll back. You said INSR then was actually at Pier 54. Yes. What, what was the reason for INS being there? I, that you know of? I personally didn't know uh, really the reason for INS to be to be there, you know, because at the entrance you have the NYPD, you needed to show your, you know, government-issued ID in order to enter, you know, uh, the building. And INS was inside. Uh, was it to give advice to anybody who has an immigration issue, but you have to get inside in the first place to even uh, assess, ask all the questions. We have a lot of people, you know, some women who were not working, and their husband were working in the building, who, whose husband passed away, and they couldn't get in. They couldn't ask anybody any question because they didn't have a proper credential to get in the building. So a lot of these then people didn't really get any services that were being offered. What about no? Um you know, they have all these funds for people who suffered um, from the debris from 9-11 and stuff like that, all the health issues. Is that available to members of VAC or people who worked at um, Windows on the World? Yes, that was available to those who were able to provide some documentation, some proof that they were working there. I mean, that was, it was something that was really, really important. But in our case, generally, it was... Uh, stress or related, related difficulties. Otherwise, uh, windows on the world walker and they were not part of the cleaning. The people who got really sick were primarily those who were at the site when the building collapsed, the first group, and the second group were those who were part of the cleaning. Because when the building collapsed, those who were around, those people got a lot of trouble. You know, they breathe the debris. But the other group was those who did that work. And as far as we're concerned, I think uh, anybody 
I work at Windows on the Wall, you know, who had some mental issue uh, were being seen by doctors and in different hospitals. Um, yeah, um, this is Adam. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, your event last year at 9-11 was very moving, and I see you really have a strong community, and that's a great thing you've created and helped create uh, together. Um, with um, the uh, lack of access to services, I think that um, helped create your service. And um, I know that some of the faith community, like the Unmet Needs Roundtable at New York Disaster Interfaith Services, tried to step in, but it took some time. And, uh, you know, even if some of the agencies that we were talking about have their rules that they have to help people, no matter what their status is, uh, some of them did and some of them didn't. But then, as you said, it was the way the whole center was set up that, that scared people away. There was a young woman who uh, was, um, I think, never listed in any of the lists, um, and, and I don't know if she was a true case or not. I met with her family. Her na- last name was Karamodov, um, Karamodinov, uh, Uzbek uh, immigrant, undocumented, and um, she's not on any official list, a- and I con- uh, tried to um, get them connected with uh, those agencies, and uh, yet, you know, 10 years have passed, she's not on any list. She was supposedly working at an Amish market in the World Trade Center. I don't remember an Amish market, and I don't know any, you know, um, after a while her family disappeared, and I never, that's always remained a question. You know, uh, is she someone who, you know, and her family were never treated properly, or was it a scam? You know, it's possible there were some. So, um, but I don't know, if, if did you meet, in the people you met, both from the restaurant and also the regular customers, I mean, can you think of any other stories where people had a hard time uh, getting served? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, your story is similar to one that I heard. I've been contacted by many people uh, from uh, uh, Mexican immigrants, you know, family members calling and uh, trying to see if I knew one of the son was working in the building, but uh, there was no trace of it. Uh, the problem was if you you come from Mexico and uh, you use somebody's document to work at Windows on the Wall, and uh, something happened, your family knows you've been working in the building, but the name you used to work in the building is not a name known by the family. So uh, they come, you, they... All the official records can be checked, but they can't find the individual. There were a lot of cases like that, and sometimes they were working in one of the uh, one of the cafeterias in one of the towers. And I mean, uh, it was very difficult. Uh, the worst part was, you know, you have those guys working at windows on the wall. You know, all of them, 100 percent of them, they were paying taxes. But at the end of the day, you know. All those who were undocumented didn't get unemployment benefits. So what really happened is right at the time when, you know, uh, 9-11 happened, they lost their job. They didn't have any means to survive because there was no job out there to get, no unemployment for them. Very dif- difficult to have access to services appeared in 94 so it was very difficult. We were fortunate enough with those who are to say, okay, I'll go to unemployment. I'll get at least $400. I'll manage for three, four months until, you know, the depressed economy get better. And uh, then I will reenter the job market. But there was nothing. So so you know? just hearing that, um, not to jump in too quick, but I guess that's where WAC came in. To speak about a little, a little bit about WAC and some of the things like colors I know it all got a big hype when it opened up and stuff like that, but speak a bit about what New York and what it's doing and, you know, what it did back then. Yeah, uh, the first thing that Rock New York did was, uh, like I said earlier, it was to create a community. You know, we created that community sharing information. I come, I, for example, uh, spoke to a few people, say, oh, I went to Association from Tepeyac, they did this. You know, I, home, I went to Home Builders Union, this is what they did. So that information, instead of going to Pier 94, the information was coming to Rock, the center. And anybody who got the help in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx, we're bringing the information and we're saying, okay, this is what can be paid. This is where you should go if you want your rent to be paid. This is where you should go 
if you want your utility bills to be paid, if you, this is where you need to go, if you want to have a ticket for groceries. So that's how RAC really started in the beginning, because you couldn't call the company Windows on the Wall and ask for the list of its employees. It didn't exist. It was not a time where people were saving information online. The cloud computing was not there in 9 11, 2001. Cloud computing. So, yeah, the, the, the restaurant management themselves didn't have our name. They had to go to the union and use the list that the union has for our use paying list. That's what was considered as, you know, the employees of Windows on the Wall. Otherwise, the company itself didn't have any record. What does WAC stand for? ROC. Yeah, it, so it, uh, it is a Restaurant Opportunity Center of New York. Okay. You know, the center developed in 2000, April 2003 and uh, obtained its own 501c3. And the first thing that we did, we said, you know, uh, right now we're doing a lot of service, but we don't think that, you know, after 2001, 2002, you know, we can continue service. Oh, we decided to do a little more of it, organizing research and uh, really helping educate restaurant workers and policymakers. So this is how RAC uh, started. Now, as of today, we published more than six, you know, reports. We won nine campaigns. And RAC even developed to such a point that the former co-directors are running now a national RAC. So today we have a rock New York. Because of the same situation that happened in Katrina, we were called in New Orleans to open a center. So there is a rock, you know, New Orleans, there is a rock Chicago, there is a rock LA, there is a, a rock in DC, you know, there is a rock in Miami, a rock in Detroit. So again, it is a model that really works. So and through the rock, we were able to open a restaurant and use a restaurant to only you know, develop our members, the leadership, but also do a lot of the training. Well, so New York created one thing out of, well, out of the tragedy in terms of from a level of undocumented restaurant workers. Um, I know WAC has a, um, a training program coming out of Colors. Um, again, because we're talking about what came out of 9-11, the event itself, yeah. the sudden impact that happened, but then the things that people are doing, especially the ones that we consider to be the lowest of the low, the undocumented, the legal, all the names they call us, but here it is that we have something, something is happening. Some You guys did something to alleviate some of the stress that we spoke about earlier. It ties into what we're saying. What is Colors, you know, what is Rock is doing, what Colors is doing? Yeah, uh, I just want to make it really clear. We work with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, immigrants, people, uh, because we want to help the people. The first thing that we ask is not, you know, what is your status? That's Seen. not the kind of business that we're doing. So it will be even difficult for us to know who is a documented, who is not documented. We know a lot of immigrants with, you know, language issues. You have somebody who uh, is come from Mexico who spent 10 years in the dishwasher because nobody's going to give him the opportunity, can pay school, is, you know. You come to Rock. We send you to our training center. You get the skill. We help you, you know, learn a job. So these are activities that we, we engage in. And for us, what is really important, what is really key is to understand that after 9-11, there were really two groups of people. Those who said, you know, I am a victim. I need to go after these people who made me a victim. And there are those who said, you know, I know I'm a victim, but I do want to help those people who are uh, suffering more than me. And that was rock. Got you. And helping those people is a way to help yourself. So out of the tragedy, you know, came rock, which is a positive thing. And out of rock came Carlos. And out of Carlos, you know, for the past six years, we, we can say we train about 2,000 people. So if you look at 10 years down the road, we can say out of this tragedy, then something really bad happened, but we were able to transform it into a positive energy and do good with it. Exactly. Yes, um, man? Yeah, I'm just wondering, 
Colors is is uh, open for business, and can listeners uh, um, go and have dinner? Uh, do you have to make a reservation? Uh, how does that work? It's it's, it's yeah, good uh, food, I know. Yeah, the <laughs> reservation line is uh, is uh, open. Uh, Call two one two seven 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 eight four four three is a res- reservation line. It is open for dinner from Wednesday to Saturday. Uh, any banquet service that you're looking for on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. If you have a non-profit organization, you want to organize a lunch, you want to organize a breakfast, uh, a dinner, these three days, it is open. We have competitive prices, and uh, we even open for lunch now from Wednesday to Saturday, so to Friday. So these are things that we're trying to do, and through even our uh, lunch service, we're doing internship. The folks we're training, you know, we're helping them get the skills to learn a job. Because many of the people we're training, probably they come from Brooklyn, they come from, from the Bronx, they've never been in a fine dining restaurant setting. You know, whatever they ate is, you know, in both fast, fast food restaurants. So when you train them, you need to help them understand what it is to serve a customer. And that's through the internship that we're providing at Colors. At Colors. But it is, it is really great. We open for the community. If the community has something to do, just give us a call. We'll make sure that we get, you know, something really decent for you, a competitive price. You want a catering, we can do it. So we're really inviting the community to support the business. We can we kinda want in tight and timely, but could you a couple of things that I want to join here. Could you repeat the number again for colors, but also before you do, um that's a question. Is the staff graduates of your training programs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, from the bartender to the servers to people in the kitchen, yes, these are graduates of our our training center. They graduate from the training center. Some of them work at colors. And when they garner more experience, they go to places where they can make a lot more money. So it is well oiled. It is really worked. And again, the number at colors is uh, 212-777-8443. Now, for anybody also interested in our training, that's a 212-343. One seven seven one, or you can go to our website at rocknewyork.org. You will get all the information. We provide the server training, the bartending training. We provide also the back of the house training, you know, and uh, which is basic cooking, basic pastry, edible design, and uh, barista, which is specialty coffee making. The other training we provide, it is free of charge. Seku, much thanks, and I know the work that you do is definitely important since we do a lot of things with you, families for freedom and stuff like that. But keep it up, you know what I mean? Just stay strong. Thanks for being on. Thanks, Seku. You're welcome. Eid Mubarak to you. And uh, it's a really uh, great project and and, uh, inspiring. Um, We're we can uh, pl- do some air check uh, or maybe uh, stuff if you if you want to play uh, any WBAI announcements. But uh, this is WBAI 99.5 FM, War on Immigrants Report. And it's part of the Global Movements Urban Struggles Collective. And don't forget that there was a recent um, fun drive. And keep in mind that WBAI is a listener-sponsored radio. And, you know, if you're out there listening, you got some extra dollars and stuff like that. Similar to what WAP New York is doing, WBAI provides a service for people who have voices and also people who need to hear some things that are not being heard out there on the regular station and stuff like that. So WBAI 99.5 FM. Hi, I'm Brian DeShazer, director of the Pacifica Radio Archives. Ten years after the tragedy of 9-11, Pacifica Radio will present a national broadcast featuring special programming from each Pacifica radio station and the archives that examines its impact on American society. We invite you, the listener, to be part of the Pacifica Radio Archives Hour by including your voice along with those of Stephen Rohde, Howard Zinn, Maxine Waters, June Jordan, Bertrand Russell, Jermaine Greer, and many others. Tell us about how you heard about the attack, what you did, how you feel 10 years later, or perhaps you heard something on Pacifica Radio that was extraordinary. The subject is wide open. Call us at 1-800-735-0230. We want to hear how 9-11 changed your life or your worldview. These will be part of the commemoration broadcast on September 11, 2011. The message number again is 1-800-735-0230. Seven three five zero two three zero. Nee, you know more. Philip Kai. In one station, ninety nine point five FM.
WBAI. In the Nibli, Liberia, the money in one WBAI.org. Hi, my name is Philip Kai, and I always have my radio tone to 99.5 FM WBAI. When I go back home to Liberia, I listen on the web at WBAI.org. Uh, this is Adam Carroll. Aloha um, from uh, War on Immigrants Report. And Donald Thompson from Families of Freedom. And I hope Philip is still listening at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, we were just talking with Sekou Sibi, uh, who worked on Winners on the World. And we're, we're looking at the 9-11 anniversary and the exploring the meanings of the disaster, how that, that's a discourse, public discourse, and looking at, at uh, some tools that exist for us to um, use in our conversations about 9-11. Um, is it all about flag-waving? Who gets to tell the story? Who's included in the story? And um, we have I- Iram Sheikh, writer uh, from the West Coast, who's been exploring themes, themes of identity and ethnic tension against the backdrop of the global war on terror. Um, Iram uh, provides a, a space for former detainees to tell their stories and reveal the human cost of suspending civil liberties after a wartime emergency. In her new book, Detained Without Cause, Muslims' Stories of Detention and Deportation in America After 9-11, she has created an oral history featuring the voices of deported truck drivers, students, newspaper vendors, and building contractors, and of their families swept up in post-9-11 raids. Many of them were kept for many months in abusive isolation in Brooklyn's MDC prison. Iram visited Palestine, Pakistan, India, and elsewhere to follow these families after their post-9-11 deportations. And uh, Iram is uh, a filmmaker and scholar and uh, recently was working uh, in Palestine at Birzeit University. Hello, uh, Iram. Hi, Adam. Hey, how are you? It's good to be with you. Thanks Thank for you. joining Thanks us. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, it's not bad. There's a little bit of static, but we should be fine. Um, so, Iram, um, I was just wondering, this big project and this book that's just come out, why did you take on this project? Hello? Aha. Uh-huh. Hello? Ah, we lost it. We'll try her again. Um, the ghost in the machine again. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, just meanwhile, I mean, of course, 400,000 Muslim, I mean, sorry, 400,000 immigrants were deported last year. The numbers are huge. That's immigrants in general. So when we talk about the post 9 11 uh, deportations, the numbers are much smaller. But it was in context of a, a uh, ro- racial profiling, religious profiling, and a paranoia that resulted in uh, uh, unprecedented restrictions of human rights within the prisons. And, uh, you know, ended up with Guantanamo, ended up with uh, supermax prisons and, and, and abuses, uh, of, you know, uh, of all kinds. And so, um, looking at these stories, these are possible lessons for us, uh, now, um, because it, it does affect, uh, us, uh, in the here and now. So, Iram, are you back? I am back. All right, we'll I try to keep you. Uh, that's problem. um, yeah, so I was wondering this project, why, why did you take this on? Well, I, Partly, there was so much, um, I was hearing so many stories around me where people were being detained. And um, so that was part part of the reason for me to pick up this project. I wanted to find out what is really happening. There was hardly any information in the mainstream media. And um, I was um, just hearing these different stories and one of my own brothers was investigated by the FBI um, only just because he's uh, originally from Pakistan. And uh, it really shocked us because we've been living in this country for over 30-some years, and suddenly we became suspect. Um, eyes were on us. And uh, um, I wanted to know more about it, like why these kind of detentions, these investigations are happening. Um, so that was part of the reason for me to find out. Right, and the personal reason, um, you know, that that your brother was Pakistani and is Pakistani, and also uh, a pilot, and that apparently yes. was enough of a reason. He was a, yeah, yeah, he was a pilot. He was a pilot for the United Airlines, but 
before working for the United Airlines, he was the Air Force pilot for the U.S. military, mm-hmm. um, and he retired as a major, and he had a top-notch clearance, and uh, he used to fly AWAC planes, which are surveillance planes. And, um, and none of that stopped uh, him from being... Uh, no, no. They were suspicious of him, and they investigated him on September 11th, and they were not satisfied with his answers. How did they investigate him? Yeah, what, what? How did they do it? He was in South America at that time, so they went to South America that same day, and they wanted to investigate him. And my brother was pretty polite, and he thought it was, you know, just simple question and answer. Um, but he, they were not polite. They were really rude in many ways. Um, and then they wanted to uh, search his home, which was in Florida. And he didn't, he couldn't come back to Florida at that time because all of the flights were stopped. Um, and he did not want them to go just because he's a private person, but they wanted to break the door. So he signed a consent form and they were in his one bedroom apartment for three days. Um, and they searched day and night with such lights. Everybody was concerned in the neighborhood. People who loved him and people who didn't know him, they were all concerned what is happening. And, of course, they drew in, uh, they brought in newspapers and the media who wanted to know what is going on. And, of course, then there were newspaper articles about him who were saying, mysterious pilot vanished. And then they gave his name, his address, and then they said, oh, we found, they found terrorist paraphernalia from his house. And this terrorist paraphernalia was... Uh, Five novels that he used to read, which were written, written in Urdu, which is a Pakistani <laughs> language, and that was the that, that was the terrorist paraphernalia. Excuse me, um, that, I'm sorry, uh-huh. but was is your brother obviously is he a citizen? Was he a citizen? Yeah, I mean exactly. This is what my book is all about: is that you know he's been living in the thirty years, so he was a citizen. If he had not been a citizen. I am sure he would have been detained. Mm-hmm. Because many of the people that I interviewed after that, the only difference, for the most part, of course there are exceptions, I, I, I met people who were citizens also, but more for the most part, most people were not citizens, or they had a pending immigration violation, and the, the government officials were able to pin them down on those immigration violations, use that as a strategy, to hold them in detention and then um, continue to keep them and tell the public, oh, we have detained 20 people, we detained 100 people, and the number continued to increase until the lawyers started to question and challenge the government, and then they stopped giving the numbers and said we cannot give the information. But by that time, three months, I would say six to seven months, the weeks after 9-11, there were about 1,200, 1,300 people already in detention. And these all people, they call special interest cases because they were special. And because they were picked up on immigration violations, they had most of them, not all of them, but they were not treated as immigration detainees. They were treated as terrorists. They were treated as potentially who were involved, linked with Al-Qaeda or had connection with 9-11 attacks. So it, what it meant that they were um, deprived of their legal rights. The security guards abused them because they considered them as terrorists, somebody who brought down nine, um, a Twin Towers. Um, so there was a lot of physical, emotional, psychological abuse that these people suffered because of the fact that they were linked by these enforcement officers. And I would say partly it is, this is some people at the top who wanted to um, who wanted to create that kind of a category, who wanted to kind of create a sense of fear among the people. It, it kind of worked at many different levels. Like at one time, at one, at one, at one level, they wanted to create a sense of fear, or oh, there are a lot of uh, terrorists among us. But at the same time, they wanted to appease the people also, appease the fears of the people at the same level by saying, oh, you know, trust us. Trust us, we have arrested people. We are in control. And uh, 
Yeah, Irum, uh, so you got to know these people, and if you could speak about how you got to know them and how that was, uh, getting to know them, uh, either during or after the deportation. Um, you know, the, um, the way, you know, uh, I believe it's 62% of that first 1,200, which were named, uh, were in the New York area, and uh, that meant that the crackdown against these generally immigrant Muslims were uh, was basically affecting New York City, another wave of disaster, uh, in fact. Um, mm-hmm. And so with these New York, uh, with our neighbors, basically, with these New York Muslims, um, how did you make the connection, and, and how was that for you? Well, um, I met some of the people while they were in, in jails. Um, like I met Ahmed Muhammad Azmat, one of the persons who was arrested, Right after 9-11, um, I met him at Hudson County Jail in New Jersey. Um, and, um, you know, meeting him, it, it was a, it was an interesting experience to go and meet somebody in a, in a detention center, um, and meet somebody with a telephone line across the glass window. And then I, I traveled India and I met him at home. And of course, then, it's a very different kind, different kind of an experience as you enter the homes of these people. You find them as brothers, as husbands, as fathers, as sons, as neighbors, um, with families around them, with people who love them. Just like a human being, just like people that I know, my own brothers, my own nephews. And uh, so it was a similar kind of a relationship. I found them, and they were devastated. I mean, of course, they were devastated. They, many of these people were immigrants who had come to the U.S. for better economic opportunities, for the most part. But some had come for better political, um, for freedom also. You know, they have filed asylum or they felt that America would provide them better, um, would provide them freedom or would provide them better opportunities. And, and their, their lives were shattered because of this suddenly picked up and then thrown in jail and then kicked out of the country um, without any resources, and, um, and then yes, and, and shame and st- stigma also with it. Yeah, I was uh, actually about to ask you about the shame and stigma. I mean, every individual personality is different, and and what kind of uh, variety did you see in the way people um, both suffered and tried to get their lives back together? Well, it was you know, no matter what explanation you want to provide to the the community back home, and many of them understood. Many of the local communities understood and th- that what was happening in, in the U.S. after 9-11. They read in the newspaper, but still, they couldn't understand why somebody with an immigration violation would be placed in a special housing unit in New York and treated and would not have the ability to make a telephone call, why they would be abused. That connection was such a large, there was a, such a large gap between immigration violation where people would should be held in a regular detention center and given all their rights. And sometimes many of those people are allowed to even get released on a bond. On the other hand, these people, which were especially kept in metropolitan detention center in New York, Brooklyn, um, they were held in Comunicado. Um, no legal rights. And so it had a lot of psychological, I, I felt they were psychologically torn, these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it was difficult for them to make the explanation back home to their own families. Mm-hmm. Like I met the wife and the children, and the, uh, I'm, I don't know how much time I have, but um, the wife of Azmat Muhammad told me that, you know, he's a different person now. He's not the same person. He also told me that he mm-hmm. still constantly thinks about, um, you know, after I met him in 2003, then later on I met him in 2008. In 2008, he was still thinking about what had happened to him and why it had happened to him. And he still feels a sense of shame living with the community. Um, so Iram, he, um, we're going to um, add another um, guest on, and we'll have you both sure. on, so if you could hold on. Um, we're asking um, um, uh, Conrad um, to uh, join us. Um, Conrad Adderer is the Director of Life or Liberty 
um, which is a media project uh, working to produce documentaries on immigrant communities. And he just finished a film about um, WBAI radio host Farouk Ablamuti, um, who, um, you know, and he was very involved in the successful campaign. So we're going to play about 30 seconds or so of, of the video, um, and you'll hear the, 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 um, the voice of Mr. Almuti, and then we'll be uh, all together and we'll, we'll continue the discussion. I was still a bit worried I was getting in over my head with Farouk's story. Turns out I was right, but not the way I thought. My name is Farouk Abdelmoti. I am from Palestine. Now I passed six months and my lawyers fighting for my rights. You have people here in the INS uh, for years. The INS is coming to be an instrument, the negative instrument, it's the ugly face of the American uh, society. This campaign against and many of us remember Farouk. I remember him walking around the neighborhoods with his son and uh, he um, um, actually, I, I remember complaining about him because I thought he he was kind of uh, unhelpful politically. I didn't agree with him, but I liked him personally, and uh, and and I almost worry that my complaints may have added to uh, I don't know the somehow contributed to him being detained. I don't know, but but he was definitely I think got uh, the notice of the authorities because of his views on Palestine. And um, um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, f- um, is this uh, is Con- Conrad? Are you with us? Yes, yeah, I'm here, Adam. Yeah. Um, I y- congratulations on finishing th- this film, and we're here also with Iram Sheikh, who has a new book out. And um, both of you are working um, to um, explore the experience and and to raise up the voice, to share the voice of. Um, um, Muslims and and Arabs and South Asians who were uh, affected by the post 9/11 um, crackdown. And so I was wondering, Conrad, if you could just say something about your project. Well, uh, I basically started out trying to get just stories of people that uh, people that I could interview who were either affected or were detained, and it was, as you might imagine, pretty difficult for a while. And then I actually. Um, I had a couple of interviews and a, a short project, and then I came on WBI, and that's when uh, they told me about Farouk. And so I uh, managed to get an interview with him in Passaic County Jail, and that, and that was like he had already been there for uh, over six months at that point. But at that, uh, he just really um, had a lot of um, – he just was a very generous spirit, and he really engaged me. He had a way of building solidarity like with – all kinds of communities. So he started talking about the internment, and I, uh, my grandparents happened to have been interned during World War II. And just the, you know, the way you know, even in the most difficult situation, he always was uh, finding um, common ground with other people, and, and uh, you know, showing that the kinds of different experiences communities go through, and, and how we can form solidarity around that. So, uh, and it was a very difficult stru- struggle to get him. Well, eventually he was released, and then unfortunately he he passed uh, three months after that. Yeah, and Mr. Quite uh, Muti had a, a stroke just after he completed a community presentation in Philadelphia. It was a heart attack, actually. He did. Ah. He, he actually, uh, on the literally on the last word of the speech, while people were applauding, he he uh, just lost consciousness. Were you there? Uh, or I wasn't there, but it, actually the footage is in my documentary. Mm. I'm completely jumping to the end now, but uh, but yeah, but there's there's so much that happened up to that point. Um, I mean, it was a two-year fight to get him out, and uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights um, got involved. They carried on his habeas corpus petition, which which was based on the fact that uh, as a Palestinian who had left uh, the West Bank before the Palestinian Authority was created, he could actually not... The um, the ICE was detaining him on, on the basis of a deportation order. And it's the kind of situation that that um, a non-citizen can, can easily find themselves in. And, um, you know, and even with with the resources of uh, some some great lawyers and, and, uh, 
and Shane, Shane Cadido from the Center for Constitutional Rights, it still took a long time to get him out. And, and um, I understand that uh, you know he was stateless Palestinian, and uh, he should have been released after six months uh, under the 2001 rulings of the Supreme Court um, because he was undeportable, but they kept him 23 months uh, and 250 days in solitary confinement, I understand, from the CCR's website. Um, right. The other aspect of the, the story that gets in the film is that he uh, he actively resisted while he was in detention. He, he organized uh, protests. He organized hunger strikes. He got um, more than 100 people to from New York and New Jersey to come out outside of Middlesex County Jail where they were housing a lot of immigrant detainees and um, and hold a, a protest out, right outside there, which really um, upset the guards a lot and actually ended up kind of backfiring in a way. But he was just very bold that way, and, and, um, and uh, he really had very little uh, fear for himself, which was, was what really comes through in the film. Both of you, Iram and, and Conrad, you know, have taken on these projects that, you know, um, make sure that um, history is not forgotten and brings human beings and their voice uh, to uh, to us and shares that. And and I was wondering, you know, it's it's a it becomes a very personal uh, project, I would guess, uh, because you're you're a participant observer. Or you're you go beyond those. The, you're, you're you're playing many roles, and I was wondering if you could both speak about how that feels. And again, it's the anniversary. Does that change anything, or does just life go on and the struggle continue? Uh, maybe uh, Iram or or Conrad, whoever wants to. Well, Iram, you know, I just finished talking, so you can go ahead. Um, hi, Conrad. How are you? Great. You with you? Yeah. Likewise. Um, how it feels? I guess uh, it's always, um, you know, when. I remember working on the uh, internment of Japanese Peruvians um, who were interned also during World War II. I worked on the project, and um, I always felt outsider at, at a certain level. Um, 9-11, after 9-11, it was a very, um, like an insider kind of a thing. Um, I think there's a little more emotional baggage that goes along with it. Um, as being also part of the community that you are researching. Um, I mean, I don't think, you know, when I was doing my research about Japanese Peruvian and the internment of Japanese Peruvian, um, I was not a very, I was, you know, I, I, I felt I had more freedom at a certain level. I could ask more questions. I, there was not a lot of fear. I, I don't know why. I mean, it was stupid. I didn't feel fear. But after 9-11, because I knew that I was part of the enemy, um, that the, that many people perceived me as part of the enemy, um, I became fearful um, of my own safety at many levels or asking certain questions. Um, so I would say that's the difference. That's the main difference between... Um, Mm-hmm. Between these projects for me. Mm-hmm. And Conrad? Uh, well, for me, I guess the question was about kind of how it feels uh, this at this point in, in the era, like when we've seen these 10 years go by. I mean, it. Um, I really learned a lot. Farouk was really a catalyst for making me understand how things, how these kinds of... Um, periods unfold and um, you know part of it is, is uh, um, legal which is important to understand and I think um, you know it's important to communicate but but also just um, I guess but there's an inspiring aspect to to just the kinds of uh, bonds that form you know when, when uh, you know different groups come to the United States uh, you know uh, these, there's all different experiences that happen, and then they they kind of unfold in different ways over different generations. You know, and I, I and Fru kind of uh, was a catalyst for my going into my own family history and talking to my grandmother, who I'd never talked to before about the camps. And and then uh, last year I went to the Tule Lake pilgrimage, and Tule Lake is one of the particularly um, devastating experiences uh, 
in the internment where they they uh, sent um, people who were designated as disloyal, and um, at one point uh, martial law uh, tanks rolled in and basically put the place under martial law. It was very it was a real hotbed of of all kinds of conflict and. Um, and so, and it was also a very painful story for the Japanese American community that wasn't talked about for a long time. So to go on a pilgrimage and to, as someone who you know, a generation or more removed from those experiences, to be kind of taken into that fold of the community and to to have the right to to put that in a film and to to tell others about it um, was a very touching experience for me last year. And so, and it's something I want to. There's stories I I'm percolating. At the time that I would like to put, uh, you know, in the form of film as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're running out of time, I wanted to say that you know I appreciate the reflection uh, is so different than the hype uh, that we're getting in the media and the the connection with history, the connection, you know, that we can find meaning in our experience through uh, looking at the patterns in history and 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 really going deeper. And and I think both of your projects really uh, help that process and uh, I don't want to just say it's a healing process it it is what it is and it's 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 very important so um, detained without cause Muslim stories of detention and deportation in America is is published by Palgrave um, and uh, that is available on, on, on um, well online I'm sure and in bookstores um, and I know that you're speaking around the, the country as well Iram and uh, have many other projects I um, just wanted to quickly ask uh, uh, Conrad, um, I understand you've got a um, something coming up at Alwan? Yeah, next Thursday, uh, September 8th, at Alwan for the Arts on uh, 16 Beaver Street, there is going to be a screening and, uh, and a discussion, followed by a discussion with some people from the communities that are concerned in the film, and um, as well as someone from American Friends Service Committee and... and um, Amy Gottlieb, mm-hmm. uh, talking about immigrant attention, how you know has affected different sort of used as a, as a um, a weapon in the sense of you know to to inflict terror on communities that that are under suspicion in these times. Uh, so that's happening next Thursday, and a few and there's more screenings that are unfolding uh, over the next couple of months. So you can go to my website enemyalien.org. So it's the website again. Uh, enemyalien.org. Uh-huh. Yeah. Thank you, Conrad. So September 8th at Alwan Center for the Arts on Beaver Street. Um, please see it. Please buy the book. Um, thank you both very much. We're running out of time. So thank you, Adam. Um, uh, this is a longer conversation, much, and I hope that it can continue. Let's remember those who are no longer with us, and uh, including uh, Farouk, uh, uh, formerly of WBAI. Yeah, before we go, just a real quick announcement. Families for Freedom, we got a couple of events happening. Um, we'll be out on Eastern Parkway for Labor Day. Um, Franklin Avenue, we'll be handing out stuff, selling T-shirts. Also, original founder and producer of War on Immigrant Support, Subash Katil, they're having a fundraiser at the Delancey for his radio show. Let's talk about it tomorrow. WBAI, War on Immigrant Support. See you next month.